The president's decision to hit China with new tariffs today underscores the kind of powerhouse it has become on the global stage economically. In fact, China is ranked as the world's second largest economy, well behind the U.S., but on its way to becoming the largest. Tonight, our economics correspondent Paul Salman hears a personal take about how the country has evolved in the modern era through generations of change. It's part of his weekly series, Making Sense. I mean, this is a good one. Yeah. Alvin, Anna, and Scott Tung are longtime Americans. Mm -hmm. But the family's history over the last century tracks China's evolution into a global economic power. From American public media, this is Marketplace. Rising lifestyles and expectations fuel this consumption boom. Scott Tung, a former colleague of mine at the NewsHour, reported on China's explosive economy a dozen years ago as China bureau chief for Public Radio's Marketplace. But he was advised to take the long view. When I first moved there in 2006, a banker who'd, you know, salty old banker who'd been there for more than, a, more than two decades said, you, you, you people come and you get skyscraper syndrome. Something. Tang like told this story so, to me and to uh, an audience at still, Portland, Oregon's Powell's City of Books. And I said, what is that? And he says, well, you kind of, everything is new, so you think China is a new story and you don't really understand the long story. So after his stint in modern Shanghai, Tang returned with his parents to seek out his and China's past. The result is A Village With My Name, which starts with Scott and Dad Alvin visiting the ancestral village where everyone shared one key trait, as Alvin learned when he tried to be polite to an old man there. So I said, what's your honorable last name? You look at me as if, you idiot, I'm a Tom. <laughs> Scott's paternal great-grandfather was remembered for leaving the village to study in Japan. We learned that he was part of the scholars who were part of kind of this enlightenment generation in China. Uh, so this early opening to the outside world. Great-grandfather Tong Junyong symbolizes for Scott the first of three eras that define modern China. Globalization, at the turn of the 20th century. And they were all connecting with these modern ideas, these isms of the time. Darwinism, feminism, capitalism, empiricism, Marxism, all these modern ideas uh, at the time, and they were kind of these cultural middlemen. He also marries a Japanese wife, Japanese woman, uh, which comes at a great surprise to his Chinese wife back in the village <laughs> when he goes back there. When Mao Zedong's Communist Party took control in 1949, China closed its doors. Collectivizing agriculture helped cause a famine that killed up to 40 million people. And a new generation of cosmopolitan Tongs found themselves on the wrong side of history. My father was 10 years old, and he got to Taiwan. And he eventually comes to the U.S. for graduate school and has this great uh, white-collar American career. And his brother gets left behind. And his brother got left behind because? My, my grandfather decides that he is just going to take his, his older son with him. And he leaves one son, and, and the wife he leaves behind is pregnant with another son. Those left behind were punished for their family's ties to Mao's opposition. Well, my uncle was a great student, but he wasn't allowed to go to the best schools. Uh, during the Great Leap Forward, during the, the famine period, they had fewer rations than other families. They're eating the, they're taking the, scraping tree bark off of the trees, but they had to soften it somehow. Uh, just, to, just to get it down. Just to be able to, to get the, the, that down. The other thing that happened to my uncle was he and other students were sent away to learn from the peasants. Learn so how to farm. Learn how to farm, learn the values of the revolution, uh, and, and then come back and my uncle received one of the longest sentences of 10 years. On Scott's mother's side, his grandmother, Mildred Zhao, escaped with her children to Hong Kong. But his grandfather, Carlton, was convicted as a counter-revolutionary. He got sent to the Chinese Gulag in the 50s, uh, the middle of nowhere, uh, horrific uh, weather conditions, and the prisoners who were sent there, like in the Soviet Union, most of them didn't come back. And they died there, you mean? They died there. So my grandfather, uh, he didn't make it back. But we learned a lot of what prisoners went through then. Prisoners would talk about how many grams of food they got in the worst of times. There is a noted documentary. There's this searing scene 
where one of the prisoners vomits onto the ground, falls on the ground. And then one of the other prisoners kind of follows him and, and picks up uh, a couple pieces of food and he eats that. I've been trying to avoid that s subject all my life. Scott's mother, Anna, was understandably reluctant to revisit this painful past. I lost my dad when I was around 10, and um, it was just too painful to go back. I finally realized every Chinese family in our generation have this story, and so many of us do not want to tell it, and I think these stories need to be told. The Tang story continues in the third era of modern China, which began after Mao's death, a reopening to outside investment and ideas, which paved the way for today's massive industrial economy. Scott's cousin works at a GM plant, one of a dozen in China. Uh, and he's very proud that he not only works as a manager in that factory, but he drives a brand with great cachet in China, and that's Buick. So he's sitting pretty. From the outside, everything looks really good in my cousin's life. And Chinese life is improving at about 10% a year, right, numerically. Life right. is just getting better throughout his life. Yeah, right. He has uh, a nicer, sleeker laptop computer than I have. Uh -huh. He has a fancier camera I'm than sorry, I have. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, you, I mean, that's just kind of how it is, right? But um, he, he does have a lot of challenges. And the biggest problem this generation has in China today is being able to afford property. Maybe in the United States, you could work for 10 years and, and buy, buy some property. There, it was more like 30 or 40 years. Really? To just be to able buy, to, to buy, buy anything. Something. Anything. Anything is just virtually out of reach. And so why did this matter? Well, a lot of women in China, they're not going to marry you unless you have property. Right? They're looking for financial security as well. I and mean, this is a place where there's a lot of uncertainty. And the story that breaks my heart about my cousin is his girlfriend in the plant she left him for one of his other friends in the plant um, because this friend owns property. Turns out the workers who took American auto jobs have stresses of their own. They're competing for jobs, for property, spouses. The Communist Party, which has now set up President Xi Jinping to be ruler for life, argues it has the solution. The people defending the Communist Party will say, you know, we have, we have had so much chaos and instability in a single lifetime that we need someone to kind of bring the stability to the country, and that's the party. At a meeting of Alvin and Anna Tang's church book club, members enjoyed Chinese New Year's treats and shared their own encounters with the Chinese Communist Party. How many of you have been to China? So this is a lot of people here. Ken Kraft felt the heavy hand of the government when he opened a QVC TV office in Shanghai in 2001. We always had to bring people in that were part of the government, uh, and we had to make sure that their hands were well greased in order for them to get to the next level. Jim Godfrey resisted a shakedown in Suzhou, but he says... And if you ever do a deal with him, you probably didn't get the best deal. They're going to outdeal you every time. And he sees China flexing its might in more worrisome ways. Politically, I worry about what's going on in China. The building of new islands in disputed international waters, increased tensions with U.S. allies like Japan and South Korea. So has China entered a fourth phase, another closing down? Scott Tong's take? Maybe. There's more open criticism of outside ideas, Western democracy, Western free press. At the same time, we have the internet uh, and these other ways that a young person can go out and connect with ideas from the outside world. So this is this push and pull that's happening in China. A tug of war that's oh, been going she. on since mm -hmm. Scott's yeah. great grandfather left oh, the Tang no, village. This is PBS NewsHour economics correspondent Paul Salmon reporting from Portland, Oregon.